So, derivatives. They're one of the two big main topics of calculus, the other being integrals, but what are they really? Well, I'm going to talk about that in this video, and I'm going to start by showing you an example where we don't need derivatives, because we can completely analyze the situation mathematically without resorting to calculus. So, imagine we've got a helium balloon that's rising up into the air, and its height, x seconds after it is released, is given by the equation or the function y equals 3x plus 5. So as the balloon floats up into the air, its height is always three times how many seconds it's be been since you let go of it, plus 5. So it starts out 5 feet up. After 1 second, it's 8 feet up. After 2 seconds, it's 11 feet up. After 3 seconds, it's 14 feet. After 4 seconds, its height is 17 feet, and so on. So, if you plot points, with the x-coordinate being the, the time, the number of seconds, and the y-coordinate being the height, the points line up in a straight line. And the slope of that line is 3. And that's because from any point on the line to any other point on the line, if you take the change in y, how much y has changed by, divided by the change in x, how much x has changed by, that always comes out to 3. So every time x goes up by 1, y goes up by 3. Or however much x goes up by, y always goes up by 3 times that amount. So your height is increasing by 3 feet for every one second that goes by. And that's because this is a linear function. The function y or f of x equal to 3x plus 5 is a linear function, and so the rate of change or the speed is the slope of that line, and it's the same at every point. But not everything that moves, moves at a constant speed. Some things move faster and then slower, and they change speed. Not every graph is a straight line. Some graphs are curved, so that they go in different directions at different points along the curve. And not every function is a linear function. So here's an example of a nonlinear function. f of x equals x squared plus 1. You'll notice that the graph is not a straight line. It is a parabola. And it's going in different directions at different points along that curve. So we can't just talk about its slope or the direction it's going. And if you look at the points that make up the graph, sometimes when x goes up by 1, y goes up by 1. But sometimes x can go up by 1 and y goes up by 3, or by 5. Or sometimes when x goes up 1, y goes down 3. So the change in the y-coordinate, or the value of the function, relative to the change in the x-coordinate, or the number you plug into the function, that depends on where you are, or what the x is. It's different at different points. So with a nonlinear function, we can't just talk about the slope of the graph or the rate of change of the thing that the function represents, the way we can with a linear function, but we can talk about the tangent line, the slope of the line that is tangent to the curve at some specific point. What direction is the curve going at some specific point? And it's going to be different at different points along the curve. Or we could talk about the instantaneous rate of change, how fast something is moving or changing at some specific instant. And it may be different at different points or different instants. So at different points along the curve, we can talk about 
which way the curve is going by thinking about the tangent line, that is the line that is just touching the curve at that point, and that's what tangent means, it means touching. So the line that is just touching the curve at that one particular point, and then going the direction that the curve itself is going at that point. If you were swinging something like a yo-yo around in a circle, and then you let go of the string, it would fly off at a tangent. So look again at the graph of this function x squared plus 1. I've drawn a few examples of tangent lines to the graph at a few different points. And then over here, I've listed the slope of that tangent line at each of several different points. So at this point here, where x is negative 1 and y is 2, the tangent line has slope negative 2. At this point here, the point 0, 1, the tangent line has slope 0. And remember, a line with slope 0 is a horizontal line. At the point 2, 5, the tangent line has slope 4. And if you look at this list of slope of the tangent line, do you notice a pattern here? Can you see the relationship between what I said the slope of the tangent line is and what the x-coordinate is? Well, yeah, the slope of the tangent line is 2 times the x-coordinate. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. 2 times 0 is 0. 2 times 3 is 6. That's true for this particular curve, but it might be a different relationship for a different curve. But for this function, the derivative of this particular function, x squared plus 1, is 2x. So if f of x is x squared plus 1, we can say that the derivative f prime of x equals 2x. So far, I haven't explained where this comes from or why it's 2x. I'm just showing you this as one example of a derivative. Now, suppose we took two separate points that are both on this curve, just different points on the curve and we connected those two points with a straight line. That would be called a secant line. A secant line is a line that connects two different points that are both on the same curve. What would the slope of that secant line be? Well, of course, it depends on what those two points are. But suppose I call this first point, well, I use a to stand for its x-coordinate, and then its y-coordinate would be a squared plus 1 because this is, after all, the graph of the function x squared plus 1. So every point on this graph is going to have its y-coordinate equal to its x-coordinate squared plus 1. Then this other point I'll call, well, I'll use b to stand for its x-coordinate, and then its y-coordinate would be b squared plus 1. So if we have the coordinates of two points on a line, we can calculate the slope of that line by taking y-coordinate minus y-coordinate over x coordinate minus x coordinate. So here that would look like b squared minus or b squared plus 1 minus a squared plus 1 over b minus a. And if we do a little algebra on top to simplify that, the b squared plus 1 and we subtract the a squared plus 1, this one minus this one kind of cancels out and we have b squared minus a squared. And then that's a difference of squares, so it can be factored into b plus a times b minus a. But now we've got b plus a times b minus a divided by b minus a, so the b minus a's cancel out, and we're left with b plus a. So the slope of that line is b plus a. In other words, on this particular curve, if you take any two points on the graph and draw a line between them, the slope of that secant line is going to be the two x-coordinates added together. The x-coordinate of the second point plus the x-coordinate of the first point. So what I've got shown here, the x-coordinates are negative 1 and positive 2, which add up to positive 1, and this line does have a slope of positive 1. Now, what if that second point was really, really close to the first point? So that b, the x-coordinate of the second point, is close to a, the x-coordinate of the first point. 
then the slope, b plus a, would be close to, almost equal to, a plus a, or 2 times a. Hmm. What if that second point was not just close to the first point, but right on top of it? What if it was equal to it? Then b would be equal to a, and the slope would be equal to 2a, right? But wait a minute. How would that work? If the second point was right on top of the first point, how could you draw a specific line connecting them? Because you've really only got just one point, and there are all sorts of different lines that can go through one point. So this is where limits come in. Derivatives are defined in terms of limits. And so if you take a calculus course or look through a calculus textbook, they usually start talking about derivatives right after they finish talking about limits. So here, what we can do to get around the fact that we can't just put the second point right on top of the first point and then draw a line between the two points is we can take two separate points, draw a line between them, but then look at the limit as the second point approaches the first point. So that would be like the limit as b approaches a of b plus a. And that would be a plus a, or 2a. Here are a couple another examples to look at to kind of uh, oh foreshadow what's going on with derivatives. This is the graph of the function f of x equals 1 over x. That's what the blue graph here is. And I've drawn a few examples of tangent lines to that graph at a few different points. And then over here, I've listed what the slope of some of those tangent lines would be. And maybe you can see a pattern here relating the slope of the tangent line to the x-coordinate at these points. It turns out that here, the slope of the tangent line is negative 1 over x squared. So like, for example, when x is 2, we have negative 1 over 4. So with this function, the derivative of this function, 1 over x, is negative 1 over x squared. If f of x is 1 over x, then f prime of x is negative 1 over x squared. Again, right now I'm not telling you where this comes from or why this is the formula. Just showing it to you as an example. And here's the function sine of x with a few tangent lines showing. And here the slope of the tangent line, its relationship to the x-coordinate, is that it's equal to the cosine of that x-coordinate. So when x is 0, the slope of the tangent line is the cosine of 0, which is 1. At the point on the graph where x is pi over 2, the tangent line slope is the cosine of pi over 2, which is 0, and so on. So the derivative of the function sine x is cosine x. Now we talked about taking the limit as the second point approaches the first point, or as b approaches a, so that we could say the line that is tangent to the graph of a function at a particular point, a, f of a, has slope limit as b approaches a of f of b minus f of a, that would be the difference in the y coordinates, over b minus a, the difference in the x coordinates. It's usually not written like this, though, because in math we usually use le letters like a and b to stand for constants, and if b is a constant, we usually don't have it approaching something or changing. So instead, this is often written with an x as the variable that is approaching a particular number c. So here the particular point that we're focusing on has an x-coordinate c, and then the y-coordinate that goes with it would be f of c. And then we have this arbitrary other point x, f of x, and we take the limit as that x approaches c. And this is called the derivative of f of x at the point where x equals that particular number c. So it's denoted f prime of c. So the derivative of a function f of x at the point x equals some particular number c, written f prime of c, is a number that measures the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f of x 
at the point where x equals c. And then, of course, y would be f of c at that point. f prime of x is a function that gives the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f of x at any point. So c is a particular number. x is just a variable. So when we talk about f of x, that's some function of x, some expression involving x. And then you could plug in some specific number in place of x if you want to look at some specific point. Differentiation means finding the derivative of a function, either just in general in terms of x or at some specific point for some specific number c. And then to say that a function is differentiable at a particular point means that you can do that. You can do the differentiation. The derivative does in fact exist at that point. Now I'll come back to all of these in this video. But first, why do we care about derivatives? Well, one reason is that they give us the slope of the tangent line, and that tells us about the graph of a function, which tells us about the function itself. If we know the slope of the tangent line, we know where the function is going up and where it's going down and how steep it is, how fast it's going up or down. Sometimes we're interested in where the function has a maximum or a minimum value, where it has a high point or a low point on the graph, and those are usually where the tangent line is horizontal. That is where the slope of the tangent line is zero. And the derivative represents the rate of change of a function, how fast the value of that function is changing relative to the variable that it depends on. So, so far I've explained the, the derivative or the slope of the tangent line at a point as being the limit as some other point approaches that point. But another way to look at it that's sometimes more convenient is to think of it as the limit as the distance from that other point to the original point approaches zero. That is, as the distance between the two points shrinks down to zero. Now, the early calculus way of thinking about limits in the first generation or two after calculus was invented goes something like this. Think of dx as standing for an infinitesimal, that is, infinitely small, change in x. Not zero, but infinitely close to zero. So, you have a point, and then you have another point that's infinitesimally close to it along the curve. So it's not right on top of it, but it's infinitely close to it. So you can still connect the two points with a straight line. So that new x-coordinate is equal to the old x-coordinate plus the dx, the infinitesimal amount that x changes by to get from the old x to the new x. Then the corresponding change in y, we could call that dy, and that would be the difference between the new y-coordinate and the old y-coordinate at those two points on the graph. So that would be f of the new x minus f of the old x. And remember, the new x is equal to the old x plus dx. So then the slope would be the change in y over the change in x. It would be f of x plus dx minus f of x over dx, or just dy over dx, if we're using dy to stand for that change in y. And that would be the derivative. So like I said, that's the way people pretty much thought about these things in the early days of calculus. But looking at this, you may have a problem with that. How can something be infinitely close to zero, but not zero. What does that even mean? If they really are two different points, then there has to be some specific distance between them. But if there isn't a distance between them, and they're really the same point or right on top of each other, how can you connect them with a specific line? So, seems kind of confusing. Does it really make sense? 
Well, the answer to that question kind of depends on where you are in the history of calculus. The 1700s response back in the early days of calculus was, well, it all works out. If we think of it that way, we can, we can do calculations and figure out what we need to figure out. So don't worry about it as long as it works. Then a couple of generations later, in the 1800s, mathematicians were able to make it, things make a little more sense and place things on a little firmer logical ground by having something represent the amount that x changes by and then take the derivative to be the limit as that change in x approaches zero. So derivatives ended up being defined in terms of limits. And that's pretty much the way we still talk about it today. That's how calculus has been formulated ever since. That's how I was taught. That's how most calculus classes and most calculus textbooks present it today, at least when they're talking formally and rigorously. And that's the way I teach calculus. Again, when I'm talking formally and rigorously, I do sometimes say, well, intuitively, to get an idea of what's going on, you can kind of think of it in terms of, okay, the dx stands for this infinitely small change in x, but if we're going to make things really make sense and be mathematically rigorous and be able to define things and prove things, then we formulate things in terms of limits in the way that I'm going to go on and, and specify in just a minute here. But then sometimes it, sometime in the 1900s, specifically in the 1960s, uh, mathematicians, and, and especially a guy named Abraham Robinson, came up with a way to formulate things not in terms of limits, but in terms of infinitesimals, things like dx, that really are mathematically defined in a sound, logical, mathematically rigorous way. So that's called non-standard analysis. That's a different way of formulating the, 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 the mathematical basis behind calculus, derivatives and things like that. And to do it in a mathematically rigorous way, it gets more complicated than just saying, oh, think of dx as this infinitesimally small thing that's infinitely close to zero, but not really zero. So it does get kind of complicated either way if you want to make it mathematically rigorous, but this is the way that it is possible to do calculus. So when I teach calculus, like I said, I mainly talk in terms of limits, the, the standard way that we do calculus ever since the 1800s. And I sometimes appeal to my students' intuition or tell them they can think sort of in terms of, well, you can kind of think of this as an infinitely small change in x. But if you want to give the official definition of the derivative, the way it's done nowadays, you can either talk about it in terms of the limit as the other point approaches the first point, the way I've already shown you, or you can do it as the limit as the distance between the points, the amount that x changes by, getting from one point to another approaches zero. And the way I've written it here, I've called that distance between the points that's approaching zero h. I've used the letter h to stand for that. And some calculus books do use the letter h for this, for the distance between the x coordinates of the two points. But other books use delta x. And that's what I'm going to be using for the rest of this video, because that's kind of traditional in math. That triangle looking thing in front of the X, that's a delta. And when you see that in front of something else, it represents the change or the difference in that other thing. How much that other thing has changed by in going from one value to another. How much of a difference there is between the two values. So. If you look at a bunch of calculus textbooks, some will use h for this, some will use delta x. I prefer delta x because delta x really does mean the change in x, the difference between the two x values. So I told you how the early calculus way of thinking went. 
And to make this more rigorous and define it in terms of limits, it goes like this. Think of delta x as a change in x. Not an infinitely small change in x, just some amount that x changes by. So you have a, an old or an original x coordinate, and then a new one that's a little bit different. So delta x is how much different that new x is from the old x. So the new x is the old x plus delta x. And then the corresponding change in the y coordinates, the difference between the two y coordinates of those two different points. That would be f of the new x minus f of the old x. That is f of x plus delta x minus f of x. Then we calculate the slope of a line by taking the change in y over the change in x. So that would be f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. And then we take the limit of that as delta x approaches zero. And that is how the derivative is defined. That by definition is f prime of x. By the way, this expression that we're taking the limit of is sometimes referred to as the difference quotient because it involves a difference, things being subtracted, and a quotient, things being divided. And there are two different kinds of notations that are both commonly used to indicate a derivative. There's the prime notation, f prime of x, or y prime. So if you have a letter that stands for a particular function, you can put that prime marker after that letter to stand for the derivative of that function. But we also use the d or differential notation for derivatives. d something on top and d something else on the bottom, like dy dx, represents the derivative of the thing on top with respect to the variable on the bottom. So sometimes it's a lot more convenient or meaningful to write derivatives that way because maybe we have more than one variable involved and we want to be specific about what variable we're differentiating and what we're differentiating with respect to and things like that. So these are both commonly used notations for derivatives, both ways of writing the derivative of some function. So, in case you missed it, here is the definition of the derivative of a function. It's given by, well, it's, it's denoted f prime of x, and that is, by definition, the limit as delta x approaches zero of f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x, provided this limit exists. And in this definition, think of delta x as the variable. It's the thing that's doing the approaching in the limit. And don't think of the delta and the x as two separate things. Delta x is all one thing. That is the variable in the limit that's approaching zero. And as far as the limit is concerned, the x is constant. It's not going anywhere when you take the limit. So the result of evaluating this limit should be a function of x. You should end up with not just a number usually, but a function or an expression involving x. And then you could take that expression and you could plug in whatever particular number you want to get the value of the derivative evaluated for that particular number or the, the slope of the tangent line at that particular point with that particular x coordinate. Now it does say provided this limit exists. If you know about limits, you know some limits exist and some limits don't exist. If the limit does in fact exist for a particular x, we say that the function is differentiable at that x. And I'll be saying more about that and, and why it might not be differentiable towards the end of this video. But let me show you an example or two about how this definition works, how you would actually use it to find a specific derivative. Let's use it on the function one over x. And earlier I showed you the graph of that function and I actually uh, revealed what the derivative should turn out to be. So if you remember from earlier in the video, you know what the answer is going to turn out to be. But let's work it out. Now I can show you where that comes from. 
So we got to take the limit as delta x approaches zero of f of x plus delta x. So that means to take the formula for f of x and replace x with x plus delta x. So that looks like instead of 1 over x, it's now 1 over x plus delta x. And then minus f of x, just 1 over x itself, and then put that all over delta x. So this is just that difference quotient for this specific function. Now, if we went ahead and let delta x approach 0 now, we'd have a 0 in the denominator. And this numerator here, the, the whole thing we have on top, this delta x would be going to 0, so this would just be a 1 over x plus 0. And if we take that minus this 1 over x, that would be 0. So we have a numerator and a denominator that are both approaching 0. And if you remember about finding or evaluating limits, you know that when the numerator and denominator both approach 0, we got to do some more work to figure out what the limit of the whole thing is. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and subtract these fractions by getting a common denominator. So I'm going to take the first fraction, 1 over x plus delta x, and multiply it on top and on the bottom by x. And I'm going to take the second fraction and multiply it on top and on the bottom by x plus delta x. And now both of these fractions will have the same denominator. Both denominators will consist of x plus delta x times x multiplied together. And now that they have a common denominator, we can go ahead and do the subtraction and get a fraction that has that common denominator. And then the numerator will be this numerator x minus this numerator x plus delta x. So the x minus x cancels out and we still have a minus delta x. So now it looks like minus delta x over x times delta x times x plus delta x on top over that delta x on the bottom. So the numerator and the denominator both have a factor of delta x. We can divide that out or cancel out that common factor and simplify it to negative 1 over x times x plus delta x over 1. And now we can go ahead and evaluate the limit. We can go ahead and let delta x go to 0, which means we get negative 1 over x times just x all over 1. In other words, that's negative 1 over x squared. So that is the derivative. We've just shown that if f of x is 1 over x, that means f prime of x turns out to be negative 1 over x squared. Let's try another example. Use either version of the definition to find the derivative of f of x equals x squared minus 4x plus 3 at the point 5, 8. So here we're interested in not the derivative in general in terms of x, but the derivative for that specific point where x is 5 and y is 8. So there's two ways we could do this. We could use the same definition, the same version of the definition we were just using to find a formula for f prime of x and then plug 5 in for x. Or we could go ahead and use this other version of the, the definition of the derivative with c being the number 5 and go ahead and go straight to what f prime of 5 would be, that number. So I'm going to do it both ways. First, this way f of x plus delta x, remember that means you take f of x and replace every x with x plus delta x. So you get x plus delta x squared minus 4 times x plus delta x plus 3 minus, and then here's f of x, x squared minus 4x plus 3, and that's all over delta x. Now, we're going to multiply some things out. When you take a binomial, something plus something else, and you square it out, you get the first thing squared plus 2 times the first thing times the second thing plus the second thing squared. So that's why I got x squared plus 2 times x times delta x plus delta x squared. And then distributing here, we get minus 4x minus 4 delta x plus 3. And now we're going to go ahead and take care of the subtraction. And some things are going to vanish and get out of our way. This x squared minus this x squared cancels out. This minus 4x 
minus this minus 4x, and this plus 3 minus this plus 3, all add up to 0. And what's left is 2x delta x plus delta x squared minus 4 delta x. So we got that on top all over delta x on the bottom. Now notice all three terms on top involve a factor of delta x. So it's going to be no trouble to divide each of those by the delta x on the bottom to get 2x plus delta x, after all delta x squared, delta x times delta x, divided by delta x, leaves us with delta x, minus 4. Now go ahead and take the limit. Let delta x here approach 0, and we get 2x minus 4. So that is the derivative in general, in terms of x. f prime of x is 2x minus 4. So f prime of 5 would be 2 times 5 minus 4. So that would be 10 minus 4, or 6. So that's the answer. And if you remember that the derivative represents the slope of the tangent line, that means if you take the graph of this function, x squared minus 4x plus 3, and go to the point 5, 8 on the graph, and draw the line that is tangent to the graph at that point, that tangent line has a slope of 6. It goes up 6 spaces for every 1 space it goes across. Now let's do the same example, but using that other version of the definition of the derivative. This time we're going directly to f prime of 5 by taking the limit as x approaches 5 of f of x minus f of 5 over x minus 5. Now f of 5, f of c where c is 5, would be 5 squared minus 4 times 5 plus 3, which comes out to 8, which it should. After all, if it wasn't 8, that would mean that 5, 8 was not on the graph, and this would be a, a bad problem. So we have verified that when x is 5, y or f of x is 8 to go along with it. So putting everything in the, the limit definition here, f prime of 5 is the limit as x approaches 5 of f of x, x squared minus 4x plus 3, minus f of 5, which is 8, over x minus 5. And the numerator, if you take the plus 3 minus 8, that simplifies to x squared minus 4x minus 5. Now, if we go ahead and let x approach 5 now, the numerator would be approaching 25 minus 20 minus 5, 0. The denominator would be approaching 5 minus 5, 0. So we have one of those 0 over 0 situations. What can we do? We can factor the numerator. It factors into x minus 5 times x plus 1. And then there's a factor of x minus 5 on top and on the bottom that we can cancel or divide out. And now we just have to look at the limit as x approaches 5 of x plus 1. And that would be 5 plus 1, which is 6. So whichever way we do it, we get the answer is 6. Now, there is an easier way rather than going through this limit calculation. And that is to use rules of differentiation. If you have studied calculus, you probably remember finding derivatives of functions using rules. Like, for example, there's a rule that says that the derivative of x to a power is the power times x to that power minus 1. So there's a whole bunch of rules for derivatives. And the definition is used to prove or justify those rules. But once you have the rules, you can just use the rules to quickly and easily find derivatives of functions without having to go back to this definition and work through a limit calculation and all that. So I'm not going to show you those rules in this video. This video is already getting pretty long. But that would be kind of the next thing you would study in going through calculus. Once you learn what derivatives are, what they represent, how they're defined, then you learn the, the easy rule-based way of finding derivatives of specific functions. And if you've taken calculus, I'll bet you maybe remember more about that 
than you do about this limit definition for derivatives. Now, I said I would come back to differentiability, what it means for a function to be differentiable and why it might not be differentiable. Remember, the, the definition of the derivative says it's given by this limit provided this limit exists. What if the limit doesn't exist? When does that happen and why? When is a function not differentiable? Well, well, there are a few different things that could go wrong that could make a function not be differentiable at a particular point. For one thing, if a function is undefined at a particular point, it can't be differentiable at that point. So if there's a missing point or a point that's not on the graph, we can't talk about the slope of the tangent line to the point to the to the graph at that point because there is no graph at that point. And if you go back to the definition, it involves f of c, the value of the function at that particular number c. If that has no value, if that f of c doesn't exist, then we can't find the derivative. So that's one thing that can go wrong. The function might just be undefined at that point. Second thing that could go wrong is, even if the function's defined, it has to be continuous. If a function is not continuous at a point, it cannot be differentiable at that point. So if you go back to the, the limit definition, if x is approaching c, this x minus c on the bottom would have to be approaching c minus c, which is zero. And if you're looking at a limit of a, a fractional expression where the denominator approaches zero, the only way that limit could exist is if the numerator also approaches zero. If the denominator approaches zero and the numerator doesn't, the limit can't possibly exist, which means the derivative wouldn't exist. So the only way this derivative could exist in a case like this would be if the numerator is also approaching zero. That is, if the limit as x approaches c of f of x minus f of c equals zero, which means that the limit of f of x is the number f of c. And that is by definition, what it means for f of x to be continuous at that point. It means the value of the function at that point matches the limit of the function as x approaches or gets close to that point. So if there's a point where the function is defined, but it's defined to be something that doesn't match all the other nearby values, it's not continuous there, and so the derivative can't exist. So it's harder to be differentiable than it is to be continuous. If you're not continuous, you can't be differentiable. But if you are continuous, you still might not be differentiable. There's still some things that could go wrong. And one of those things is, if a function's graph has a sharp corner, or abrupt change in direction, it's not differentiable at that point. So an example of that would be the absolute value function. The graph of the function absolute value of x is this v-looking graph. Remember, the absolute value of a positive number is just that number itself, but the absolute value of a negative number is its opposite, which is positive. So as we approach zero, from the left, we're headed this direction, in the direction of a line with slope negative one. But on the other side of zero, on the right of zero, we're going in a completely different direction, the direction of a line with slope positive one. So we make this abrupt, all of a sudden, instantaneous change in direction right here at this sharp point zero, zero. So right at that point, you can't say whether you're going this way or this way or what. It doesn't really have a direction or a tangent line at that sharp corner. And if you went back to this limit definition, in order for a limit to exist, it has to be the same as you approach that number from the left as if you approach it from the right. But here, as x approaches zero from the left, and we're thinking about x's that are less than zero, 
the absolute value of a number less than zero is the opposite of that number, and this limit comes out to be negative one. But as x approaches zero from the right, we're looking at x's that are greater than zero, and the absolute value of a number greater than zero is that number, and we get a limit of positive one. So it's different on different sides of zero, so that limit just as x approaches zero doesn't exist, and that means the derivative doesn't exist. And the, a, a fourth reason that a function could fail to be differentiable, even if it's defined and continuous, is if a function's graph is going straight up and down at a particular point, if it has a vertical tangent line. Because remember, a vertical line has undefined slope. The slope of a straight up and down vertical line is undefined. And that would mean the function is not differentiable at that point. An example of that would be the cube root function at the origin. Here's the graph of the cube root function. f of x is the cube root of x. It's defined and continuous for all x, but right here where x is 0 and then y would be the cube root of 0, which is 0, it's defined there, but it looks like right there the graph is headed straight up and down. So the tangent line there would be vertical, but the slope of a vertical line is undefined. Now it turns out that the formula for the derivative, if f of x is the cube root of x, f prime of x is x to the negative two-thirds power, or 1 over the cube root of x squared. And if you try plugging 0 in for x into that derivative, you get 1 over 0, which is undefined. So that's an introduction to derivatives, how they are defined, what, you, what they mean, their significance, how you would find a derivative directly from that definition, and why occasionally you can't do that. And as I said, the next step would be to learn some rules of differentiation that make the process of finding derivatives of functions a lot quicker and easier and save you from having to go through that, that whole limit process every time you want to find the derivative of a function. But that would be a topic for another video. Thanks for watching.